you're playing a conductor and then it's like, but with this weekend, we're going out to the Formula One racetrack. It's like, <laughs> there's so many unexpected textures in this. It's an action movie. Do you ever find yourself overwhelmed by emotion? Yes. Yes, that does happen. Your director, Todd Field, said that there would be no tar without you, Kate. Did you know that going in? And were you able to use it to your advantage at all? Was I able to manipulate Todd into a, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> into a corner know. where he did exactly what I wanted him to do? No, I, I, did, not, I did not want a bigger trailer. No, I did not know that. And I'm really pleased I did not know that. I was daunted enough by the demands of the role and not just the demands of the role, but, but actually rising to the big questions that Todd had placed into the into the screenplay. There are big questions about power and who is complicit in holding up these power structures. And I think there are a lot of questions, uh, you know, big questions that I've been asking myself um, over recent years that um, I really wanted to not necessarily answer, but ask in a really rich way. And so there was a lot to do to, to make those questions really alive for an audience. There is just no one um, no one else that could be Lydia, I find. So Todd is completely uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I there's think... nothing to add. It's, that's yeah. it's her. I, I completely agree. I mean, she plays a conductor that's at the top of her game, right? So that requires a character who demands a lot, you know, demands respect, got lots of charisma, authority, but also this genius. And I think Kate really is amazing at those characters. I also think Kate is extremely intelligent and musical, actually. I think if she had decided to dedicate her life to being a musician way back when, then she would, you know, be at the top of her game. She would be the real life Lydia Tarr. It really is Kate conducting the orchestra. The or There's no click track. It's not done in post. It's the orchestra responding and playing with her. And that is no easy thing. She just did amazing, yeah. amazingly. I mean, she produced a sound that some conductors dream of producing. So that is like a huge achievement in itself. Well, it's a rehearsal movie. And so we had to identify um, certain sections of Mahler's um, Fifth Symphony because that's what they're rehearsing. And the gift that I think we all had was that the orchestra had not played together, hadn't played big works together because of the pandemic. Mm. So they were coming back to the big works at the same time that I was stepping onto the podium. And the first thing I said to them was that they weren't actors and I wasn't a conductor and that we had to find our way together. And they were so generous. Mm. And when you give the downbeat and that sound comes back at you, it is it is really, really something else. I've been shifted off my axis because of that experience. Yeah, absolutely. And Todd, do you see now from directing this a parallel between the role of a conductor and that of a film director? Oh, certainly, yeah. I mean, of course, I mean, uh, both things require an instrument that uh, involves uh, tens of dozens or hundreds of people. You know, a full complement orchestra is 100 plus players. Uh, that is a conductor's instrument. If you are a film director, you're dealing with anywhere from 25 to 100 plus people and into post hundreds of people. Mm. Um, and um, you can't do it alone. You know, many are the hands on, on uh, in music and many are the hands on mm. a film. Um, but you have to manage those things and you have to manage a lot of a lot of people. And, and, and people are, are different and people respond to different things. Mm. And some people uh, you play with very well and some people you play with not so well. So, um, uh, yeah, I think there's, there's clear parallels between the mm. two. In the orchestra, everyone has all their different roles, like you know, like a crew, um, and uh, everyone's working together to, in this case, realize Todd's vision and dream. And yeah, I think some parallels there could be made, maybe. <laughs> I definitely think that one thing that, in addition to you know having worked with a lot of conductors, that kind of prepared me for acting in front of lots of people on set and being able to respond to Todd's direction was playing in cello master classes where you're effectively receiving direction and having to act on it immediately in front of an audience and having to play at your absolute best and also trying to kind of build this relationship or kind of um, charm this teacher who you may or may not have met before. And I really, I really think that that prepared me, now I think about it, mm. really well for the kind of pressure of acting 
on set in front of all these people and with the time pressures as well and you know just having to be able to do your job I guess and then again you know if you're working with a conductor in an orchestra you can't just go no sorry I don't really I don't really feel like I can do it today I mean yes. I'm sorry musicians just always have to get the Brilliant. job done or you know it's it, we're always striving to achieve excellence we have a problem Nina how did you create your connection to Kate's character as the partner of, of Lydia, I was working on wh who's that person that really wants to be with someone like that? And where did they meet? And what, what, what is the connection that they both have? And for me, it was the music and that they're both really accomplished musicians in the m two most powerful positions you can have in an, within an orchestra. And you are being challenged in these positions all the time. It never stops. You have to prove yourself all the time. So Sharon is someone who has to bring that kind of confidence up also, but she does it in a very different way. I also, I always thought she is somewhat okay with the system that she's in. She knows it by heart, she can navigate through it. And those are all the things that Lydia, as the genius that she is, as this very creative person, has difficulties with. She sometimes listens to the wrong voices, she, she, she questions her judgment and, and, and all these. And so it, it, that makes you then again think about what is power abuse? And when does it happen? And the people around someone in a very powerful position, how long do they carry that system? Maybe, you know, or maybe they're even enhancing it or enforcing it or pushing her to do things that she might have not done otherwise. Or so, you know, so Sharon to me is some, someone who's, who, who also raises a lot of questions. She's yes. not an innocent <laughs> uh, uh, person, you know. So that, uh, uh, yeah, and that 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 I found fascinating to to work on, and uh, th that's how I saw those two, that they're very much alike in the sense of what they're looking for, which is to create amazing music together, um, but they're also very different in the way how they approach things. You know, Tar begins by just spelling that misconception that a conductor is just a human metronome conducting time. Uh, did you enter this film with other misconceptions about this world or ideas that evolved as you dove into Tar? I, I, I must say, I mean, I obviously I've I've been to classical music concerts, you know, um, chamber works, contemporary concerts, you know, one of the best concerts I've ever seen in my life was Sonic Youth. You know, my, my taste is really eclectic. I, I didn't really have preconceptions about it, but I learned enormous amount of the infrastructure um, behind running an orchestra. And I myself had run a cultural institution with my husband in the Sydney Theatre Company. So I knew very much about the escape to the rehearsal room and that 70% of one's time is running an institution. And so how that has on one as an artist, you know, um, when, when you don't get to do the thing that you want to do, but you get caught up in the politics of running the place. Um, so that was felt very strangely familiar to me, but it was interesting because you, you, there's a kind of a boarding house culture in, in, in tenured orchestras mm -hmm. because they're together all the time. And so the HR component of being a conductor, I think in the contemporary world is really important. But if you go back in time to Fert, Fern Bangler and Von Karajan and, and even like Russian orchestras, you know, with Gergiev, that that is something that is much more brutally dealt with, mm. you know. And so it's seeing that 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 balancing act that, that goes on and then there's the music on top of it, you know. So that was, yeah, at once familiar, but um, complicated. You must service the composer. You gotta sublimate yourself your ego and yes, your identity. You also had to play the piano, play the accordion, conduct the orchestra, even driving stunts as well. Can you talk that us through fun. that process? That was, that, that was fun. That was yeah. fun, driving yeah. the, I can't remember that intersection in Berlin, but- Alexanderplatz, the yeah, most but, famous intersection in all of Berlin. Yeah, but yeah. we went out to a racing track uh, at like 400 kilometers yeah. an hour in this silent Porsche. Yeah. It was, I mean, you wouldn't, exp you, you're playing a conductor and then it's like, but with this weekend, we're going out to the Formula one racetrack it's like <laughs> there's so many unexpected textures in this it's an action movie no but yes. there's so many unexpected textures in the film 
And Kate, we see a shared energy with your Bob Dylan doppelganger from I'm Not There, Jude Quinn. Were you able to take anything from that musical journey to this one? Uh, in, in, what, in what sense shared energy? I, I was slightly hairier in the, in the Bob Dylan. <laughs> but Bob still, Dylan. Yeah, absolutely. A, a difficult <laughs> interview on either one, you know, a, an iconoclast um, and an inscrutable iconoclast too, where you're always kind of yeah. trying to figure out like, you see Lydia doing one thing and you know she's got 10 other things going on. I just wondered it's, it's if there was any of that. Yeah, no, there's like something that I really stuck with me um, in Todd's script is that in the interview at the beginning, Adam Gopnik, the interviewer, says that Lydia Tarr is many things and she's had a very varied career. And I think she takes that as an insult. That when one is one thing, when you're just an actor or you're just a conductor or you're you're just a, um, a a visual artist when you start to step outside your lane then people don't know who they don't know which box to put you in and that is an incredibly freeing thing as an artist but it also means that you're then you're, people get, you're dis ghettoized, ghettoized or yeah. dismissed yeah. and i think that bob dylan was an absolute shape he refused to be categorized and i think that lydia takes when people think they know who she is she almost too often to her own detriment will do the opposite because she wants to remain um unknowable yeah. Because once you're known as an artist, it can be it can be a yoke around your neck. It can limit your your freedom or your capacity to change. And I think we all want to keep changing and evolving, as you know, as, as artists and as well as human beings. Yeah.